My name is Chris Enstrom. I'm the Director of Post-Secondary Engagement for the Indiana Commission for Higher Education. I want to welcome you to the third annual 21st Century Scholars Next Steps Conference. Uh, the purpose of today's conference is simple, to bring together 21st Century Scholar college students and alumni from across the state for the purposes of networking, connecting and learning, and planning out the next steps in your education or professional careers. Like I said, this is our third annual conference, and I'm happy to report that it's grown every year. Uh, this room is going to fill up more. We have a bus from Purdue and a bus from ISU who are delayed, but they'll be here any moment now. But we had over 250 people registered for the conference this year, including 190 college 21st century scholars from 24 different campuses, both public and private, 20 21st century scholars alumni, and I think there's actually more that are here today, and uh, 40 Scholar Corps members who are our AmeriCorps members giving direct support to scholars on campuses across the state, many of their supervisors, and other college staff and professionals. I want to take a moment just to give you a go through the agenda and what the day is going to look like. Uh, so uh, we have three different workshop sessions that are kind of spread out throughout the day. And you'll also notice you have a kind of a, a conference agenda at a glance. So this gives you an overview of the day. And there's a more detailed workshops description. So if you haven't had a chance, make sure you look through that carefully and really kind of drill down and pick out the workshops that are really more, most in line with what your goals are. One quick announcement. Um, during workshop A, the Choosing Career Path Wisely, led by Nicole Coleman, she had a family emergency. So that we will not have that workshop session, but all the other sessions will, will, uh, are going on as, as, as scheduled. Um, all, of the, all of the rooms are just down the stairs. And you'll, there's good signage, so if you just go right back down the stairs, you can easily find all the rooms that your workshop, workshop sessions are in. Also wanted to point out that for alumni, we have a kind of an alumni track for workshop A and workshop B. So uh, for the alumni, we actually, one small change, because more alumni showed up today, we're moving our room for workshop A for alumni track to room 109. But that's simply going to be a conversation with uh, Commissioner Lubbers. And so you'll have a chance to meet the commissioner. Uh, we'll give you some quick updates on how the program may have changed <coughs> Excuse me, since you left. <coughs> and just a chance to see about some of the milestones that we've reached and kind of what the program might look like going forward and, and really get kind of your input. And then uh, during workshop B, uh, there's an alumni track uh, that will be really looking at how, what can you do to support the next generation of scholars from middle school enrollment through college graduation. Here are some ways to connect to, connect to each other. Um, <clears throat> but I do want to point out that alumni are welcome. We have these separate tracks, but you're welcome to attend any workshops that are in line with like, what your goals are for today. Uh, we do have a Kaplan preview course that will happen uh, right at the same time as workshop B. So this is a course uh, that Kaplan's putting on. It's a preview for the GRE. Uh, to attend that session, you actually had to register pre-register, which is something you would have done through me. Uh, so if you pre-registered for that course, uh, we're going to have that. And then uh, if you attend the course, there is a giveaway. Kaplan's going to give a giveaway for full scholarships for one of their full courses for the GRE, uh, or the LSAT for students interested in, in pursuing the, um, law, or uh, the GMAT for business students. And then um, we'll have a wrap-up uh, at the end of the day and speed, uh, and, uh, speed networking, too. Uh, one thing I wanted to point out, too, is that um, for like what, what my expectations of you are today is that um, this, is, you know, this is your opportunity to, c to connect. Uh, there are students and alumni and college professionals and people from all over the state. So there can be no introverts today. So just make sure, introduce, we'll have a networking event, but just kind of, if you are an introvert, kind of come out of your shell and make sure you make some connections today. Also, I wanted to ask you to, um, we have the hashtag scholars for scholars. And so as you go through the day, um, take pictures, things you've learned, things you want to share, just make sure you use that hashtag to share it. We will have in uh, the, the website up here, and it'll be posted anytime we're back in the ballroom today during lunch and at, at other times. Um, I also wanted to point out that uh, during the conference, one of the highlights uh, every year we've had this is our uh, 21st Century Scholars alumni panel. Uh, so that will happen immediately after workshop A. It's just a chance there'll be a panel discussion here. Uh, you'll have a chance to ask alumni questions. Alumni who are in the audience, not on the panel, we want you to participate actively too. And this is a session that we've always um, had uh, great feedback on. And we've actually expen extended the time of, of this discussion based on feedback from, from past conferences. 
Um, I, I uh, just want to do some quick thank yous. I've got to cut them down because I know we're on a tight thing, but I wanted to thank Ivy Tech for providing us with this great venue. I want to uh, thank Kaplan Test Prep for providing the preview course and the scholarship um, for full classes. Uh, all the commission staff who uh, went into putting this art, the, the outreach staff led by Emily Sellers, uh, uh, Doug Lintner, our creative director, for making the commission look good in many of the handouts you see uh, in front of you, Doug designed. Uh, Liz Walker, the project and events manager, for making sure things run smoothly with the commission. And um, all the 21st Century Scholars alumni in the room, uh, our keynote speaker, Patrick Jesse, our alumni panelist, uh, the alumni who served on the planning committee to help plan this event. Uh, so thank you for your time. And of course, I want to thank the presenters. Uh, we have, uh, you know, we had, uh, we have 12 workshop sessions. We had over, I think, 25 uh, people actually uh, pr uh, applied to be presenters. So we had a really competitive, and, 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 and they put a lot of work into it. So thank you for all your time. And of course, I want to thank my Scholar Corps AmeriCorps members uh, for being here today, for all the work you do every day, uh, supporting scholars on your campuses, and to help uh, you know, get the word out about this conference and make those reminder calls and wake kids up sometimes at you know, 5 in the morning to get here today. So thank you for all the work you do and your supervisors and the other college uh, professional staff who are here today for the work you do every day to support your students. Um, and of course, I want to thank the scholars. I mean, this is why we're here. It's for all the 21st century scholars. Uh, I can tell you that with the commission, all the staff that works with this program, I mean, 21st Century Scholars is, is such an amazing program. It's made such a big difference in the lives of people. And we're always impressed to, to meet 21st Century Scholars, to see the good things you're doing, uh, and to, just to see kind of the need that 21st Century Scholars have to connect to each other but to support each other. So please continue that today, and, and, and you have a great opportunity to connect with scholars outside your campus and alumni. And finally, I would like to thank uh, Indiana Commissioner for Higher Education, Teresa Lubbers, who will give our opening remarks. Uh, Teresa was appointed in 2009 to serve as the Indiana Commissioner for Higher Education, the coordinating agency charged with ensuring that the state's post-secondary education system is aligned to meet the needs of students and the state. Prior to joining the commission, Teresa served in the Indiana State Senate for 17 years, leading on education and economic development issues as chair of the Senate Education and Career Development Committee. As commissioner, Teresa has worked to increase college completion, improve productivity, and ensure academic quality. She has partnered with policymakers and higher education leaders to implement the state's higher education strategic plan, Reaching Higher, Achieving More, and has promoted innovative educational models and efforts to control college costs. Teresa is a past chair and current member of both the State Higher Education Executive Officers and the Midwestern Higher Education Compact. She serves as a commissioner for the Education Commission of the States and a member of the Board of Trustees for the Council for Adult and Experiential Learning, and she also serves on the Indiana Career Council. Teresa holds an undergraduate degree from Indiana University and a master's in public administration from the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University. I have had the privilege of working with the, commission, the commissioner since I joined the commission in June 2012. I remember hearing Commissioner Lubber speak for the first time at a 21st Century Scholars Conference back in 2010 when I worked for IU. It was clear then that she was a strong supporter of the program, but she had a clear vision on what could be done to make it stronger. It's been gratifying to, see, to work for her for the last four years and to see that vision become a reality. Today we can say that the 21st Century Scholars Program is stronger than ever, with more students enrolled than any time in its 25-year history, and with growing incentives and support at all levels designed to do what the program is really all about, making more 21st Century Scholars alumni. Please help me welcome Indiana Commissioner for Higher Education, Teresa Lovers. Good morning. I think Chris thanked everyone in the room, and so I will thank you, Chris. Thanks for all the work that you do for the Scholars Program for putting today's event together. We're delighted to have you here with us on a Saturday morning. Uh, it's a little bit beyond the call of duty to get up early. I talked to some of my colleagues from Vincennes, and I think they left at 4 or 5 this morning to get here and be with us. But we think the day will be well worth your time and important to continue the very important work of the 21st Century Scholars Program. 
As Chris mentioned, this has been a real commitment of mine during the time that I've had the uh, privilege of serving as the Commissioner for Higher Education. Uh, everything that we do at the Commission is really focused on making sure that more students in Indiana have the opportunity to access and succeed in higher education. Like many of you, I'm a first generation college student. And um, in my family, uh, the expectation was that you would go to college, even though my parents did not have the opportunity to do that. What they knew then is what we know even more now is that the opportunity to succeed in higher education of some sort is the real opportunity for improving your life and improving the life of your families as well. And so all that we do at the Commission is really focused on that. There is uh, really nothing that we do more important. You may hear us talk a lot about, at the Commission about the big goal, which is that 60% of Hoosiers would have some sort of quality degree or credential beyond high school. What we know and what is abundantly clear is that we can't get to that goal without people who did not access higher ed education before making sure that they do that now. Uh, we have a full range of options in Indiana, as you know, uh, seven strong public systems, 31 private colleges, places where we can find the right place, the right match for people. And that's what we're trying to do very early, to make sure that students in the seventh and eighth grade, when they sign up to be a scholar, as many of you in the room did today, that you will have a clear sense of what you're doing along the way to be successful. I often speak of the scholars program in a very different way than when you talk about a traditional scholarship program. This is not just about giving people money to go to college, as important as that is. And Indiana actually ranks first in the Midwest and seventh in the nation in the distribution of need-based financial aid. So we clearly are very committed to making sure that students can afford college. That at a time when we're telling you education beyond high school is more important than ever, we need to make sure you can afford that. But the Scholars Program was designed with a very unique model, as I know that you know. It was really about getting students to aspire to go to college, to believe that college was for them, and then to prepare them to succeed in college, to know both from an academic and financial standpoint what you needed to do, and then we would make good on that contract as a state and provide the financial support for you to succeed. Because we now have 25 years of history with this program, we have represented in this room, and you will hear in just a few moments as well, from people who are now giving back to the program that changed their lives. And that's what's so key to this program. I could stand here and give you all the numbers, 110,000 people who are now in the scholars program from seventh grade sign up to college, 70,000 you know, have actually accessed a grant during those years, over 30,000 have graduated. Those numbers are important, but those are just numbers behind the people's faces and the lives that have been changed through the scholars program. That's what the scholars program is really about. It's about changing a culture of a state where you did not need to have education beyond high school to be successful to one that understands what 21st century requirements are for the workforce and to live meaningful lives. And so today you're going to hear from a host of people who will talk about the ways in which the scholars program changed their lives and more importantly what you can do to prepare for continuing education or for the world of work when you leave here. Um, I also think that it's important to know that we are expecting more from our scholars than we used to. Some of you who were early scholars who might be with us today know that we've done things like we've increased the grade point average from 2 point to 2.5. We've put in place expectations for each of the years when you're in high school that you need to meet. Those of you who work in the scholars program, I want to use this as an opportunity to implore you to make sure that scholars understand what the expectations are. If there's anything that I'm fearful about with the program, it's that not enough scholars understand what they have to do to fully access the scholarship at the end of their high school years. Uh, some of these uh, expectations are new. None of them are impossible or burdensome. They're all designed to make sure that students will be more successful, but they're expectations that have to be met. I frequently refer to them as tough love, but still at the end of the day, it's love because it's basically how we're going to make sure that students are more successful. So, and we have all kinds of new ways that we can make sure we engage with people. Mentoring programs, our AmeriCorps program, uh, working with community foundations and partnerships and, and communities around the state. This is an all hands on deck kind of effort. And those of you who are here today, I, I know I'm preaching to the choir because you understand that. 
but I want the ripple effects of this group today to be felt in the communities uh, around the state as well. So um, with that, I have the unique opportunity to introduce the real keynote speaker. I was just here to give you some sense of how strongly the commission feels about this program, how much we are committed to the work that you're doing, and how we will do all we can to help you and the scholars be successful. But you're going to have an opportunity to hear from someone who can do that far better than I can. Patrick Jesse is a 21st century scholar, graduate of the program himself. And I think you're going to hear from him just how much this program made a difference in his life. He graduated in 2001 from Bloomington High School He as a 21st century scholar, uh, signing up in either 7th or 8th grade. I'm not sure he can share that. He graduated from Purdue University with a degree in political science and found his way, as I did many, many years ago, to Washington, D.C., and um, actually went to um, law school there. He attended George Washington University Law School and following graduation was hired by a very prestigious law firm, Aiken Gump, in Washington, D.C. We chatted a little bit about that, about what it was about, those of you who've had a chance to spend some time in D.C. know it's a very intoxicating place. And so being able to get someone to come back to their home state, to come back to Indiana, is important. And he did that because for multiple reasons. He had a, a great job opportunity. He came back in 2013 and really changed his career completely. And he, he's now leading his fraternity, which he was very active in when he was at Purdue, uh, Delta Sigma Phi. And he's actually really very engaged in higher education issues and how to make sure that fr fraternities are doing all they can to make students successful and really engaging with a lot of these higher education issues that are important in 2016 as well. Uh, he's involved in raising money, and actually there are 100,000 living alums of that fraternity. But he's more important to me. I think that's great that he's doing that, and I'm very grateful for that. But for today's purposes, he's continuing to give back to the 21st Century Scholars Program. He often speaks about the program. It benefits around the state. He's helping us as a member of the 21st Century Advisory Council. He volunteers to actually put a face on this program. And I think that's so important that we do this peer to peer. Uh, just recently, he was uh, recognized as a distinguished 21st Century Scholars alum in celebration of our 25th anniversary. Like you, I look forward to hearing from Patrick today and welcome him to the stage. So, was one of my best friends in college, and he's still my best friend today. Uh, he's one of those guys, tall, handsome, funny, always makes everyone around him laugh, makes him comfortable, uh, and has great advice. He shared a lot of that with me through the time that I've known him. Uh, and, and one of the first pieces of advice he gave me was my freshman year in college. I had a lot on my plate. Uh, really too much. I didn't know what I was going to do, uh, and I was really worried about it. I was stressed out. And he said, Patrick, you just got to line things up, take things one thing at a time, and knock them down. Pretty straightforward, easy, simple advice. Nothing earth-shattering, nothing magical about it. But that's advice that has stuck with me throughout my entire life, and I put it into practice every single day. And it's the realization that that sharing of experience, sharing of perspective, sharing of advice is critical to our development. And so that's what I want to do today, is share some of my perspective, some of my advice with you. Before I do that, uh, I want to see a show of hands. Who here actually cares what I have to say? Who here thinks that my advice is, wow, great, awesome, thank you, I'm flattered. Wonderful, Commissioner Lebers did a wonderful job introducing me. Typically, uh, that's about 50-50 that I see hands raised, and that's okay. That's great, actually, I love that. I love the people who don't raise their hand, because that tells me that they're challenging me. They're questioning me. They're not quite yet bought in to what it is that I have to offer. We're often taught when we're young, when we're kids, we're told stay in line, follow the rules, don't question authority. And those things are important, but they also tend to make us not challenge things. And if you haven't been given that power yet, if you haven't been given that permission yet, this is my first piece of advice to you today. Question the process. Challenge the status quo. Question authority. Push the barriers around you. 
challenge your education, challenge the people that are giving you information, whether it's your professors, your friends, or the person on the street. Challenge their bias, challenge the completeness of the information, challenge their perspective. Be a two-year-old. Be a two-year-old. Why do I say that? Why, what do two-year-olds do? They, they ask why. They constantly ask why. You tell them they, something, they say why. You explain that to them, they say why, and it goes on, and it keeps going until they either get bored and walk away or you run out of words and, and breath, right? But they're, they're asking why. And it is that intellectual curiosity, that critical thinking ability that is key to success. It is one of the most important things that employers today are looking for. It's something I look for when I'm employing people to work for me. Critical thinking and intellectual curiosity. So to answer that question for you, why should you care what I have to say, I want to share with you a little bit about my experience, my background, my upbringing. This is a poorly rendered picture of me, but uh, did not know that it was going to come out this way, big screen. But clearly, I'm happy, I'm young, I've got nice, you can't tell it here in this picture necessarily, beautiful straight blonde hair, right? I'm enjoying life. I don't know much about, I'm four years old, I don't know much about my circumstance or my environment. But this picture is actually really telling because it talks to the creativity that was spawned from the environment that I grew up around. We didn't have access to nice things. We didn't have ac access to nice toys. I had to find a box, a cardboard box, and cut out holes in it to make windows to have something to play in. That was what I grew up in. And it wasn't until I was six, seven, eight years old that I started to become more cognizant, more aware of the poverty, the abject poverty that I was growing up in. That pain and the hunger in my stomach from not having the next meal or knowing where it was coming from, the embarrassment of being at the grocery store and paying with, we had checkbooks of food stamps back then, not these plastic EBT cards, paying for, for groceries with our food stamps and not wondering what the person behind me was thinking about me or the embarrassment at school, wondering what my friends would think about me and if they'd make fun of me for having free lunch or wearing the same three or four sweatshirts from Goodwill all year long. That embarrassment also developed into fear as I grew up. I realized when I was nine, 10 years old that it was weird. It was not normal that I was moving around so regularly. What, what happened was I was on Section 8 housing, so the government paid for most of our rent, but my father, could not or would not pay for the portion of the rent that we owed. So we constantly got kicked out. Every eight, nine, ten months, a year, we would be forced out and booted out of our Section 8 housing, and we'd have to find somewhere else to go. So I grew up in this environment of fear of not knowing when the next time was that I was going to be asked to leave the place that I called home, and wondering whether I was going to have a roof over my head where I landed. That fear was also manifested in the abuse that I endured throughout my entire childhood. Abuse of every kind from my father, and it, it intensified when I was 10, 11, 12 years old. The, my father, the person who was supposed to protect me, who was supposed to provide for me, to, to be a mentor for me, was doing everything that he should not, and nothing that he should. And the impact was more than just that direct abuse itself. It was the fear, the loneliness, the sense of self-doubt, the lack of self-worth that impacted me. I didn't have a lot of light. I didn't have a lot of things to look forward to in life. But I did fortunately have a wonderful mother, a mother who cared for me, who loved me, a, lo a mother who I loved dearly. She protected me. She was a buffer between me and my father, and she watched out for me. Unfortunately, when I was 13 years old, I lost my mother to a heart attack. This rock that I had, the person that I had to confide in, that I knew could be that buffer for me, that could be my support, was no longer there. And I was left in this circle of abuse and neglect and poverty and abuse and neglect and poverty. And I assumed that that's what my life was going to be. That's all that I had. Because no one was telling me that there was anything different for me to do. That there was an opportunity for me to change my circumstances and do something different. I looked around, I saw my family, I saw my friends and their family, and I assumed that I would maybe graduate high school, probably not, get a job at a factory or a gas station, because that's what I knew. That is the, the reality that I grew up in, what I saw around me, and no one was giving me the empowerment that there was anything else for me to do. Success, to me, was a light outside a window. Success was on the other side of this window that was greased over by the background and environment that I grew up in something that I had to look at, something that I had to be a bystander and a spectator of. I could never actually reach it and grab it and take it as my own. 
because no one was telling me that I could until, until my eighth grade year, my guidance counselor pulled me aside, Bob Pryor was his name, pulled me aside and talked to me and said, Patrick, there's this program I want you to get engaged in. It's called 21st Century Scholars. It's going to offer you an opportunity to go to college. It's going to pay for your opportunity in college, and you're going to be able to do something bigger. At that time, I had no clue what college was. No one had told me about it. Uh, and I certainly, when I learned, didn't, wasn't sure I was bought into the idea of studying for four more years. Um, but once I realized that what he was doing was opening that door for me and walking me outside on the other side of that window to engage in an opportunity to take success for my own. It was the first time someone tapped me on the shoulder and said, Patrick, you have an opportunity. You have the power to change your future, to take hold of the success that you want. And I did. I took it and I ran with it. I dedicated myself to my academics. I got a 4.0 through high school and I graduated at the top of my class. Fortunately, when I was 15 years old, I'd been taking martial arts since I was 11 years old and the owners of the martial arts school took me in. I took my dad to court and got away from the negative environment of my father. And Steve and Linda Scott, the owner of the martial arts school, took me in under their wing. I went on to Purdue University, where I got a great degree, put my 21st century scholarship to use, got a wonderful degree, graduated with an honors degree, went out to Washington, DC, where I graduated the top of my class at a top 20 law school. I went on to spend <clears throat> three and a half years doing very interesting, complex, mergers and acquisition deal work at one of the most uh, prestigious and largest law firms in the world. I travel the world. I own my own condo downtown. I own my own car. I know how to fly a plane. I have a great support system of friends and family, and I do work that is passionate to me. I moved back here three years ago, and I'm now the CEO of my national fraternity, serving over 100,000 members across the country and raising over a million dollars a year to support the educational and development leadership of those members. I'm passionate about what I do. I am successful in my own definition of success. So here's the deal. Here's the answer to that why. Why you should care what I have to say. I am you. I've been where you've been. I've walked in your shoes. I've sat in your seat. I know the trials and the tribulations. I know the difficulties. I'm all, I've also been where you're going. And I know that there is a wonderful success waiting for you, however you define your success. How, however it is that you define you want to succeed in the world, it is there if you're willing to do the work and put the time in and the effort and the energy to get it. I also want to be honest that it's not easy. It's not as if 21st century scholars came along when I was in eighth grade and the clouds parted and the sun shone down and you know, the birds were chirping and it was easy and I kind of skipped through life and you know, there was like music playing in the background. That's not how it worked, right? There were still obstacles and challenges along the way. I got to Purdue University. It's a big institution uh, and it was difficult to adapt to that. I was struggling with depression. I didn't know how to deal with it for several years. I almost failed out of college twice. Two spring semesters in a row, my freshman and I, my sophomore year, I almost failed out of college. I got a 1-3-3 both semesters. Until I turned it around and got a 4-0 the rest of the way through. It was tough. I had to struggle and scrimp and save to pay for the things that I needed to pay for to get through college. And there were still barriers and obstacles along the way through my professional career, and there still are today. We all deal with those. The reality is that on our path to success, life is a journey. It has its ups and downs, its its peaks and its valleys, its trials, its tribula tribulations, and, and its triumphs, right? And today, today is about preparing you for success in the next steps of your journey. And that's exactly what we're here to do today, right? Preparing today for success tomorrow. That's our theme for the day. Preparing today for success tomorrow. What does that mean? I'm sure we all have some concept. We could talk to that. Um, but I'm the one with the mic, so I'm going to take, take a stab at it. I'm going to share my advice, share my experience on what that means. Preparing today for success tomorrow. It starts with preparation, and it's key that that is where it starts. We probably all heard the adage that success is where preparation and opportunity meet. Success is where preparation and opportunity meet. What that means is that all the things that come to you in life, all the opportunities that knock at your door, that land at your feet, that land in the seat next to you, you will not be able to take advantage of if you have not prepared for them. Preparation is the foundation of everything that you, do, you will do. And it is one of the hardest things because it, 
it never ends. It's not a show up and do it once kind of thing. You don't get to check a box and say, okay, I learned how to prepare, I've prepared, put it on a shelf and walk away. That's not how it works. You have to do the hard work and show up every day to prepare everything from your tests to interviews to presentations, budgets, having a family, applying for a loan, paying for a loan. Everything in life requires preparation. I prepared for over 50 hours just to have this 20 minute conversation with you. Preparation is key to everything that you do. So here are my three keys to success in preparation. Know it, plan it, rehearse it. Knowledge is key. Knowledge is power. I'm sure we've all heard that before. Knowledge is power. Knowing the, knowing the circumstances and the information that surround every situation that you go into leverages your success. Take the time to think through, to rehearse, to, to, to research what it is that you want, what outcome you want about, from the situation you're entering into. What are the pieces of information and facts that support that outcome? Who are the people that are going to be on the other side of that conversation? And what outcomes do they want? What opportunities do you have to agree? What things are you willing to leave on the table? And what are the rules that you're playing by? Know it all. Know all of it. But it doesn't stop there. Because if you have all the knowledge and the information on your plate and you do nothing with it, it does you no good. So you have to take that knowledge and you have to take the building blocks and piece them together and put them together. Create your game plan. Create a strategy for how you're going to leverage and marshal that knowledge to get to the outcome that you want. And then you have to rehearse it. Because you can do all that hard work and then if you don't have it internalized, if it's not a part of you, you're going to fail at implementing it. Nine, the, the, the best sports teams in the world spend probably 90% or more of their time in preparation, practice, not actually on the field playing. The best businesses in the world do the same thing, and we all need to do it in our personal and our professional lives as well. Preparing today, preparing today for success tomorrow. Today. Here's what I can tell you about today. Today is fleeting. It is the best example of use it or lose it. Let's say you've got 10 days to prepare for something. And on day five, you wake up and you realize, I haven't done anything. I really wish I could get those days back. You don't get a mulligan on day five to go back and get those, those five days you lost. Once you've let them slip by and pass by, they are gone. And the todays that we have in our life are finite. There are only so many todays that we get in our life. And because of that, today is a competition. If you wait until tomorrow to prepare for your success, you are going to be a day behind everyone else. So here's what we need to think about when we think about today. Empower yourself. Be nimble and savor today. Empower yourself. Give yourself the power and, and the permission to succeed by starting today and not waiting for it tomorrow. Be nimble because when you prepare and those opportunities come along, there are going to be all sorts of options for you to succeed in different ways that you hadn't thought about originally. And you're going to need to be able to pivot and turn and make a decision in the present moment to do something different and unique. And savor today. Like I said, it's finite. We only have so many of these two days. So enjoy them when they're in front of you and take full advantage of them. Today, when we're here, April 2nd, at this conference, be present. Take the information as it comes to you. There are all sorts of great uh, opportunities to get information, to network, to meet people, right? I'm sure there are a lot of things that are going on in your head that don't have anything to do with here. The tests that you have to prepare for, the projects that are still on your plate left to do, maybe a fight you're having with your boyfriend or your girlfriend or your parents. There's nothing that you can do while you're here in this building that impacts any of those things that you're thinking about. Be present in today and take full advantage of the resources and the information and the support that's in front of you. Preparing today for success tomorrow. Four. This poor little guy, most people would probably skip over this. I'm not going to do that. I've got a lot more respect for him. Who remembers conjunction, junction, what's your function? Uh, yeah, right? I don't know if they still do schoolhouse rocks in elementary school, but it was big back in my day. It was awesome. Four. Four tells us two things. It tells us that a purpose is coming, and it connects us to that purpose. We're going to talk about that purpose when we talk about success, but I want to talk right now about the importance of connection, building your personal and professional network, right? If you put your head down 
and just try to drive through life and drive to your success without leveraging the resources and the people around you, you are going to limit your opportunity for success. You're going to limit it. So how do we build that network and leverage it? It's all about building your sphere, utilizing the people that are in your sphere, and being proactive. Build your sphere. You have opportunities, whether it's in your class, conferences like this, programs and clubs and organizations on your campus, professional opportunities, internships, whatever they are. Get engaged in those, but be, be more engaged than just showing up. Take the time, like Chris said, take the time. Don't be an introvert. Get to know people. Get outside of your comfort zone and pe meet people you don't know and engage with them. Build personal and professional connections with them. Get to know them because once they are in your sphere, they are your champion. They want you to succeed. There are so many people out there that want you to succeed if you just connect to them and give them the opportunity. That's where the utilization part comes in. You need to ask them what it is that they can leverage, their network, their resources, their insights, their knowledge. Leverage them to get to the outcome, the success that you want to see, and be proactive about it. This isn't high school. I think we probably all learned that by now. This isn't high school where your guidance counselor is supposed to come to you every month or two months and make sure that you're following up on your plans and connecting the people you need to connect to, right? People cannot read your minds. They don't know what you want, how you want it, or when you want it. So you have to be proactive and reach out to them and ask them. And this is the important part. Don't get afraid. Don't let fear be a barrier to think, this person is going to be too busy or too important for me to talk to. They want to help you. They want you to succeed. Preparing today for success tomorrow. Success is a big word. And it means a lot of different things. And that's the beautiful thing about it. And that's one of, the, one of the keys that I have in thinking about success is success is your own personal definition. Success is your own personal definition, right? I would also say that we need to use our values to drive what that definition of success is. And we also need to realize that, fail, that success necessitates failure. So when I say build your own definition of success, what I mean is don't let, others, don't let others impose their values or their perspective of what your success should be, what your happiness in life should be. It is yours. It is your own. It is personal to you. However you want to define your success, define it for yourself. And use your values. Define what your core values are, who you are as a person, to help drive what that definition of success is. An example of that, there are a lot of values that I hold true and core to who I am as a person. These are the five values that I've defined for myself over time as central and important to me, Patrick Jesse. Perseverance. I've been through a lot in my life, and it's important for me to be able to get up off the, off the mat and jump over the next hurdle that comes along. Integrity. I believe in doing things courageously right. Work ethic. I may not be the smartest man in the room, but I'm going to roll up my sleeves. I'm going to put the hard work and effort into everything that I do to accomplish what I need to accomplish. Self-enrichment, I believe that learning and continually growing and, and expanding our knowledge is key to who we are. And challenge, we talked about that at the front end. Challenge, challenge the status quo, be a critical thinker, be intellectually curious. Those are things that I've defined for myself as my values, and it helps me. This is my definition of success that I wrote for myself a while ago. In whatever I do, being a leader of myself and others, to identify opportunities for challenge and improvement, to put in the hard work necessary to overcome obstacles to those opportunities, doing it courageously right, no matter the outcome, and to learn in doing it. To me, that's my definition of success. What's beautiful about that is it's led by my values, and no one, no one in this room, no one in this entire city, if they sat down and wrote out a definition of success, would come up with those words, because it's mine. The final thing is knowing that Success necessitates failure. If we work in this circle that we're comfortable in, where we're not stepping off the ledge and having the opportunity to fail, to fall down, we're not going to succeed as often or as large as we otherwise could. Don't be afraid of fear. Don't see it as an enemy. See failure as an ally. It helps us grow, it helps us learn, and it helps us succeed. Preparing today for success tomorrow tomorrow. So you've done the work to define what success looks like for you. You've done the preparation that you need to get there. 
you've put it into action today and you've leveraged your network to help you get to that success. Now you've got to think about how you're going to put that into action in the path to get you to tomorrow. So a few closing thoughts about tomorrow as we wrap up. Tomorrow is uncertain. You create your tomorrow, and you really should have faith in what you create. Tomorrow is uncertain. There are all sorts of things externally that you can't control that will impact where your tomorrow leads. Be open to that, be flexible to that, and be prepared for that uncertainty. But ultimately know that you create your future. You get to create. You get to decide what your tomorrow is going to be, right? That's all yours. And it's not your past. That's important. Do not let your past define you. Your past, you have no control over changing that. It is what it is, and it helps inform who you are. But don't let it rob success from your future. And have faith in what that future can be. Have faith in your tomorrow. I had a counselor who pulled me aside when I was in high school and told me, sat me down, we were talking about college and my future and what I was going to do. And she said very simply to me, something very impactful. She looked at me in the eyes and she said, Patrick, you are powerful. You and you alone have the power to decide what your future will be. That was so impactful for me. She was telling me two things. One thing she was telling me was that I got to decide what my future was going to be. I got to decide what that tomorrow was going to look like. I had the power. I had the ability. No one else could take that from me. She was also telling me that I had the responsibility. It was on my shoulders, mine and mine alone, to create. No one else was going to do it for me. That's key. We have this power, but we also have the responsibility to do it for ourselves. So I want you to do one thing as we close out here. Take out a piece of paper and a pen and write this down. Write a note to yourself and refer back to it in the future. Put it in your head or put it in your phone, whatever works best for you. Write this note to yourself. Self, you can use your own name. You are powerful. You and you alone have the power to define what your future will be. Thank you and good luck with everything that you do. Wow, that's what a great start to a great conference. Um, I was just telling Teresa, I'm very glad we have that on tape. Uh, that's, thank you, Patrick. Definitely.